The digital revolution is here, and along with it, there's a new SAT called the Digital SAT. Today, I'm going to show you how you can improve your score by working smarter, not harder. And back when I released my first SAT guide almost a year ago, I got a ton of international students commenting about how they can improve their SAT scores for the digital SAT specifically. But now that this has been rolled out to pretty much everyone, I thought, why not update my guide? And so just for some context, my name is Rishab. I'm a Harvard student studying neuro, and I make these types of videos to help out students who are in the same situation as me, deciding, hey, what material should I use? What should I follow? This is the only kind of video you're going to need. So luckily for you, this is your online material. This is your guide. Don't bother paying, you know, $2,000 for a kind of prep course over the summer or something like that. I'm going to show you the best materials that will actually yield good results. So first off, what's the big deal about the digital SAT? I think this is really important because this is one of the first tests that we have that is completely standardized online. And this is really important because of these reasons. Number one, question banks and practice are now the most important thing. And I, I'm going to teach you kind of what you should do, what resources you should look at. But this is something that you should definitely note down. Another thing is that for the entire math section now, you get access to Desmos. And if you haven't used Desmos before, don't worry. You're going to learn how in this video. I'm going to briefly explain how you can pretty much do a lot of the SAT questions that are math related in Desmos immediately. It's just a graphing calculator and it is a major life hack. So if you learn how to properly use it, you will be a mile ahead of other students. And ultimately, because these are standardized tests, you are being compared to other students. And so this is beneficial for you, the person who's watching this. So kudos to you for watching this one. And finally, uh, another important thing to note is actually vocabulary. And so I'm going to refer to this a lot, but basically the SAT has almost been TikTokified, if that makes sense. So rather than having a long passage that you read and maybe your attention span is too short to read that whole thing, so you read like a couple lines and then you skip around and you try to find the answer, now the SAT is actually optimized for that skipping around. It's really short. There's like one passage per question. And so as a result of that, they're now testing on slightly different things. Um, it's still roughly the same sort of like, oh, comprehension, but rather than like, oh, trying to really understand the deep meaning behind the passage, it's like, how can you extract this information from this small piece of the passage? And I think that's going to become increasingly important as people become more reliant on tools like ChatGPT that can do the comprehension part for them. And they just need to like read that output from ChatGPT. So this is kind of evolving with the with the times but i will say you know there are some differences like for instance now it's increasingly important to actually know vocab on the sat which was eliminated for quite some time and if you're a non-native speaker of english this is incredibly important so for those of you who are taking the digital sat international students primarily maybe who haven't you know learned english as their first language this can be a really important part for you um, and so as you guys can see over here, there are two main categories of the SAT. There's the reading and writing as well as the math section. That's pretty standard. But now there are two modules. There's a first module and a second module. The first module is basically like, you know, the non-adaptive part. You just take this and the second module actually adapts itself based on the first module, based on your performance and how you're answering the questions on the first one, it's going to update and give you kind of an individualized test. And I think this almost eliminates like some of the things like cheating and other sorts of errors that can just come across like right the in, in between difficulties between, oh, this test was harder than the other one because March versus April or something like that. And it kind of really does standardize all of that and personalize it to you to truly kind of understand your score. Um, and College Board has kind of published data about that showing that it does. But that's enough yapping about, I think, this new format let's actually get into why you click this video right let's look for the tips um that you're here for so let's talk about the math section then i'm going to talk about test taking hacks then i'm going to talk about reading and writing hacks for that section um and so yeah let's just get started with the math section so I think, again, something really important here is you have module one and then module two. And I'm going to categorize this in terms of accuracy and efficiency. So in module one, because the questions are notably easier, you know, you're really going to be focusing on your accuracy. These questions will probably be able to 
get most of them done. And so there, it's going to be really important that you're answering them correctly. And I'm speaking especially oriented towards students who are really aiming for high scores on the SAT, right? This is the, the type of style you should be using, where on the first part, yeah, you can race through and then spend time checking back. But then just because the process of checking back, you're not authentically doing the problem for the first time again, it's possible things slip through. No, it's actually more important there to accurately kind of the first time through answer things properly. And then on the second module, because they are harder, that's where some of those efficiency things come in. Um, and so here is just an image of the Desmos platform, as I promised you. And so as you can see, it's just a math graphing calculator. But if you put in an equation, right, it plots it up just like that. But the cool part here is I'm going to actually move this uh, quadratic function down. Um, I'm just showing an intercept here because that's like some of the questions they ask is like find this intercept. Um, and as you can see here, it solves the roots of this quadratic equation just by looking at, you know, your x intercepts. And so that's really powerful, really fast to use rather than going on your TI-84 and plugging stuff in, which actually incentivizes you to use the graphing calculator over traditional paper and pencil, right? And so given this, here's the claim, you can solve 90% of all of the math questions using either your fundamental math, that's just like pencil and paper plus maybe the calculator or Desmos. And so you don't need to spend 50 hours watching videos or $50 on some book learning Desmos prep. I'm just going to give it to you. I'll have a PDF linked in the description below. Um, but here are the things. I'm going to walk through this. You can skip ahead for this if you like think you already know Desmos really thoroughly. But I'd highly encourage you to kind of just make sure you know how to do all of these things. So I, I've categorized it here. Systems of equations. So that's like solving what is x and y. They give you two equations. You can literally just put both of those equations in Desmos and then see where they intersect. And those two points or one point or whatever are going to be the x, y coordinates of the solutions to the systems of equation. Um, then there's going to be solutions to equations. So that's just kind of like this. What is x? If you're trying to solve for x, like 5x squared plus 17x is equal to 43. What is x? You can just solve those directly, as I showed you. Intercepts, there you're going to look on your x and y axes to find what intersects on that, on what, what points are on that axis. And that's going to be your X in, or Y intercept if it's like this, or your X intercept. Similarly, you can find min and max just by using Desmos again. You just type in the word, uh, or you actually just plot the entire uh, equation that you're looking at, and you just scroll around to find the minimum value and the maximum value. Very intuitive, I think. Then there's inequalities. So this is something a lot of students don't know, is if you actually take your equation, you know the inequalities where it has like the greater than or less than sign, you can just put that into Desmos. So instead of putting in an equal sign, you put in a greater than sign. And it'll plot the inequality. And then it's going to ask you like, hey, does this point satisfy the inequality or something like that? There you can actually put in a table. So over here on Desmos, in the, the, the there's a plus icon in the top left that you can probably see unless you're on mobile maybe. Um, and there you can input a table of points. And there you can just put in the points that you need to test and see if they are in the boundary of the inequality. Um, for a number of solutions, again, you can kind of just plot these equations and look at how many points are intersecting. And that's like your number of solutions. For evaluation of the function, let's say it's like f of x equals 5x plus 4. Type in f of x equals 5x plus 4 onto Desmos. And then in the next line, hit enter and then type in f of 2. And it'll automatically plug in the 2 into your 5x plus 4 equation to get 14. And it'll just give you the answer. Obviously, the questions might be harder, which is where it's helpful to use this evaluation technique. Then this is another one where I think people who probably just skipped ahead of this section are going to realize, oh, wait. I do not know how to do that. Regression. Um, I learned this in like AP Physics C using Desmos, but apparently it's just really helpful for the digital SAT is you can actually use these like tilde, like the tilde, the squiggle marks. Um, and that just helps you uh, train and fit a model to a set of data points. So um, again, the PDF guide will have like the specifics on how to do that. 
um, guess and check to find constants. Like as you can see above, right, we were trying to solve for certain constants using regression, but there may be cases where they give you a certain value and it's like solve for a variable like H or C or something like that. So like, you can use Desmos and guess and check values to find the value if you can't algebraically figure it out. A circle, you just put in the circle equation. Um, same thing for like other types of circular type things like ellipse, um, where you can just put in like x squared plus y squared into Desmos and it'll plot it for you. Um, and then there's a couple more that I'm not going to waste any more time on. Once again, the PDF is in the description below. I hope this kind of overview was helpful for those of you who are like, hmm, do I know this part or do I not? But that's kind of your Desmos crash course, if you will. So now let's get into the other half of the equation, which is fundamental math skills. And the best way to improve this is really just by doing practice questions. And for that, I'd recommend a tool called Acely by Juni, Juni Learning. And so Acely is kind of this uh, very advanced SAT prep tool that didn't really exist in the market a couple of years ago. Even last year when I was making my SAT guide video, none of these types of tools existed. And so they, they College Board, if you just use their practice bank, you might run out of questions. With Acely, you have pretty much an unlimited question bank is what they say. And I think this will really help you with your math skills because math is like one of those subjects where it's really just about practice. So making sure you're doing those practice questions rather than spending more time on maybe taking courses or like, as long as you know the fundamentals, it really comes up to practice and then identifying what you get wrong and improving based on that. So that's just some kind of like prep tip um, in addition to that, you know, I partnered with Acely to kind of introduce you guys to both this adaptive test as well as these practice questions. So Acely will actually allow you to just get unlimited practice questions in this interactive chat format where you can actually chat with the tool and it'll provide you feedback and guide you in the right direction, kind of like a personalized tutor. But obviously you're not paying um, the tutor a lot of money per hour and instead it comes in a subscription based online format and so that's why i've decided to partner with them i think it's you know the most cost effective solution for really uh practicing getting as many questions as possible plus getting tutored and kind of learning from that material um, i really also like their adaptive test feature which you can see over here and this really allows you to select question difficulties so let's say uh, module one on the math section for instance is widely considered to be a little bit easier. And then module two, you want to focus on efficiency. Well, you can't really do that if you're just going through the traditional kind of press, test prep questions and just cycling through them again and again. But with Acely, they actually allow you to specify the difficulty. So as you can see, you can select between easy, medium, and hard. And because the uh, digital AC, uh, SAT, I think people are probably calling it the DSAT now, gets more difficult as it goes. You can practice those medium and hard questions as well. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to leave you with this one more thing. Um, I think diagnostic exams, taking these really frequently, along with really just grilling in daily questions is going to lead to long-term retention. Every kind of scientific study shows this, is that you learn more by practicing material daily. And so that's why I think this is much better than, you know, going to a tutor on weekends. Instead, really just doing questions every day using the ACLE tool is much, much better. And so um, that's why I've decided to partner with them. I'll leave the link in the description and pinned comment below. I'd highly recommend you check out ACLE and I'll kind of refer to it as we go. Um, with math questions specifically, this is, I think, a, a great technique you can use. I first encourage you to kind of read the question that they give you. Um, and as you're doing so, pay attention to specific keywords. So they're going to give you questions like function or support, um, specify, and, and things like that. And so it's really important that you read the specific question that they give you. For instance, in one, they might be asking you to give you the value of X, or in another, they might give you the value of X plus Y, or in another, they'll give you a function and ask you to evaluate that. So it's really important to pay attention to those little minute details in the question itself. Then you can reread the question. This is, I think, I think something that a lot of people do. Then you solve the question. That's pretty straightforward, right? 
But now because, you know, on module one, it's really important that you are accurately answering the questions. I'd highly encourage you to reread again and make sure you are answering what's being asked and even read the question again, because you do have, I think, around one and a half minutes per math question now, um, because the test is, is slightly more time for math now. So just making sure you're spending that time and balancing accuracy on the first part with efficiency on the second part is really going to help there. And again, using ACELY for practice difficulty, like easy, medium, hard is definitely going to help a lot as well. Um, something that a lot of students have been talking about is using their graphing calculator because students will have programs, um, you know, built into the calculator where, you know, you can evaluate functions and things like that. I definitely think that Desmos is a lot faster once you use it, especially because it's built into the digital SAT platform. But um, a lot of students prefer to use their gra graphing calculator for certain types of questions. That's totally reasonable. One that I'd recommend is the TI-84 because people always comment like, hey, which calculator did you use? Which one would you recommend? I'll have a link down in the description below. Um, now, test taking hacks. And so I think this is something a lot of students who are watching this video kind of on the last day, maybe before their test will really benefit from. One is the guessing technique. And I'm here, I'm really just going to save you 10 or 20 points, right? Obviously, you don't want to have to guess on questions, right? Uh, especially if you're aiming for a really, really high score. But at the end of the day, most people end up guessing on some questions, right? You can't be certain about every single one. And so this is where this really comes in handy. Instead of just using a random spread, like let's say you're guessing all of these questions here, D, A, A, D, C, B, 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 and so on. Instead of just randomly guessing questions, if you use a consistent guess, you're actually more likely to get questions correct just because of how the spread works on the college board. And I'm, I'm taking the screenshot from like this online site that actually tested this. And what they found is that just by doing this consistent guessing technique where you guess at the same letter over and over again, let's say you have like five questions at the end, your time is almost out guess the same letter and your probability of getting a specific answer is going to increase. So that instantly saves you like 10 or 20 points, which going from like a 1510 to a 1520 could be the difference between like, hey, I'm going to retake or not retake it. Right. So that's that's, I think, really helpful. Another thing is the mark for review tool. And I think this tool is the goat. Um, I don't know why this image is so horrible, but again, I kind of talk about the the TikTokification of the SAT to people a lot. And this is effectively what, you know, the test has really become because on a lot of these questions, like the, the reading and writing that I'm going to get into, rather than giving you super long passes that you really need to understand, it's now a shorter one that you're really just looking to parse through quickly. And so now the mark for review tool is the most helpful thing in the world because previously it was like, hey, you know, you might read the passage fully, answer five out of seven questions, and then move on to some part later on the test, right? But when you come back, you kind of forgot some elements of the passage so that wastes time. But with this version of the SAT, because each passage is way shorter, marking for review really helps because if you're not immediately sure, mark it for review and come back later, right? So uh, this is just kind of goes to show that be familiar with the tools that you have, right? Guessing is a tool that you have. Marking for review is a tool that you have. Previously, you could like underline stuff, but now you have scratch paper that you can use. Be aware of these tools and really use them, okay? Especially if it's like the night before, which I know a lot of people who are watching this video are going to be in, in that type of situation. Now, I think this part is really important and it's basically do not be distracted during the SAT, right? And I think that statement is easier said than done. But, you know, I've been in that situation. I'm sure you have as well, where there's some kid underlying, underlining with, you know, a really thick, blunt pencil, and it's just making a lot of noise. Um, and in this case, like, there's going to be a lot of typing and maybe some clicking going on on Desmos and things like that. So I really urge you to mentally prepare yourself for that. You know, there's going to be students who get anxious about that, right? Get stressed about it. Um, and what I recommend you do is placebo prep. Okay. Go on Spotify, go on Apple music, whatever, go on YouTube, find in like an ASMR desk job, typing and clicking type of video and listen to that while you do practice tests and while you do questions, even if it doesn't actually get you used to it, you will mentally believe that, Hey, you know, I've encountered this on my tests, I'll be chilling and you will be locked in that way. So I'd highly encourage you to, 
you know, you may be like, okay, that's not actually going to on the test. It's going to be different, right? There's going to, it's going to be a totally different layout, different situation. It's about the placebo effect right there that you believe that like, I'll be fine. And because you believe that you'll be fine, you're going to get more sleep, which is a big question I've gotten is, you know, how, the night before you get anxious, you get stressed, you don't sleep that much. What do you do? If you know, that does happen to you, I'd highly recommend in the morning taking a cold shower. This is really hard to motivate yourself to do do this. But I recommend this to literally everyone for every important event, every important test. And I've stuck by this since like almost the beginning of high school. And it's helped me a lot in important events, important competitions, important tests and things like that. I actually do this before every single test that I have here at Harvard. Um, and it's kind of just become a ritual for me. But this really wakes you up in case you've gotten very small amount of sleep. But then you want to warm yourself up. And so while you're in the car ride to your test center, while you're eating breakfast or something, you know, go through a couple questions using ACLE or using something else, right, where you're warming your brain up and getting used to that. Talk out loud. Just get your brain kind of warmed up in the morning. Um, you don't want to just be put straight into the test and then the first section doesn't go so well and then you feel bogged down for the rest of the test. All right, now let's get into the reading and writing hacks. So first for the English questions, I think something that's really important for English is that everyone is different, right? Everyone comes from different languages. Everyone comes from different understandings of the language, just based on how much you've read or what languages you speak and things like that. So really the SAT here is not really testing like your innate intelligence about English. It's just testing your command of the language. And oftentimes these questions are almost gameable. It's kind of like a game. You can understand specific elements and then get it based on that without necessarily actually knowing why something is right. And, you know, I think it's it's helpful while you're studying to know why those things are right. But at the end of the day, if you're really just looking to get your score up, which I think a lot of students are because this test isn't perfect by any means. Right. I think it's it's really important to just understand these kind of rules. And so for the English rules, rather than saying, hey, you know, go look at this list and watch 20 hours of videos and prepare for all of these different rules, I'd actually urge you to make your own cheat sheet as you go and learn from your own mistakes. So when you get questions wrong, understand, hey, why is this wrong? And that's where the ACLE tool really comes in handy, because with the AI capabilities, you can actually just chat with the bot and understand why you got the question wrong. It'll guide you in the right direction, right? Um, but beyond that, I think there's two kind of main question types that I like to group in. One is like a pause in um, the middle of a sentence or just somewhere in the sentence. And the other type of scenario is where you actually stop in the sentence. So when you're pausing in the sentence, I would like to say this is more of a comma situation because it's like, hey, I went to the, the movie theater, the lab and the school. And you might pause right before each of those terms that you're adding on. And there you have commas. Um, this is kind of just a simple way of understanding it. The reason why I'm telling it like this is because I know a lot of people are watching this right before the test. So this is just an easy way in your brain, like tomorrow when you take the test, rank it in these two ways. If you're studying beforehand, definitely make your own cheat sheet. Another way to kind of understand it is whether it's stopping in the sentence, right? There's like two main parts of the sentence. These are like called clauses in grammar. Um, and if you're stopping in the middle of between them, you're likely in need of a colon or a period or a semicolon. And so there you need to understand the nuances of each of those. But that immediately, you know, eliminates like two of the answer choices, because a lot of the time they're just going to be showing you some with commas. And then they're going to be showing you another two that are like one is a semicolon, and one's a colon, then which one's the right. So if you can eliminate two of those answer choices, your chance of getting the question right just skyrocketed. Um, and then this is an interesting scenario. I actually took this from the ACLE platform, but um, as you can see here, there's a table of the number of films um, from specific individuals over time. And I think this is really interesting because it shows the the new SAT kind of has these almost science compre comprehension questions that were like on the ACT, where your goal is not necessarily to understand what was done in the study or how this data was collected or something, but it's literally just to look at the number and figure out the answer, which is kind of funny. But, you know, just look at the answer here or look at the question here. Which, which choice most effectively uses data from the table to complete the example? Okay. Based on that, okay, let's look at the example. It's entirely possible, for example, that underscore. So it's we need to read that last sentence. And that's like pretty much it. 
the entire beginning part, you don't really need to understand what the researchers were doing or anything like that. You can just then look at the table, look at the answer choices, and there you go. Um, how do you kind of answer these? So this comes under the reading section, even though I feel like this isn't really a reading question, but sure. Um, this comes under the reading question. I've gathered these tips after talking to some of my friends who have 1570, 1580, even some 1600s. Crazy. But you know what you can kind of do is look at the question and then find evidence in the passage that relates to words we've identified in the question. So that's exactly what I did here, right? Look at the question, complete the example. That was the word I wanted to highlight, right? So then we're going to look at the passage for the example. Once we've done that, now we can look at it, look at the answers and try to figure it out. Now, if you're struggling to figure out the answer, then go for process of elimination. And the way I'd recommend you to do this for the reading and writing section or the reading in English or writing section is specifically look at the answer choices, um, eliminate two of them. You should be able to eliminate two because oftentimes they'll be very contrasted. And so one of them, you know, cannot be right if the other one is right. And therefore you can eliminate two of those choices, either the two that were not in in that alternate situation, right? Because one of those has to be right if the other one is wrong, if that makes sense. Or you can look at, um, you know, you, you can eliminate one of them that you know is definitely wrong, and then you're left with either two or three. And from those remaining ones, then I'd recommend looking at each one and trying to figure out if there is anything you can point out that's wrong about one of them. You know, if you just kind of take a step back and look at them, you might feel like, hey, I'm kind of leaning towards this one. But that's not a very systematic or good way of looking at the questions. What I'd recommend is if you're struggling and you're like, I feel like it's kind of this one, but I don't know, really just try to figure out, hey, is there something wrong with this answer choice? Anything wrong with this answer choice? I'm going to, it's probably not right. I'm going to guess the other one. Um, then also, I'd recommend you really just practice the reading section. Aceley is, once again, like the best way to do this is not to buy, you know, the Kaplan book and like go through that and, and look at their analysis of how they read the passage or something like that. You will practice yourself and learn the best strategy for you. So spend that time, just practice, practice, practice. Um, also identify the meaning behind the question, if that makes sense, like understand what it's trying to ask rather than hyper fixating on the passage, just because this TikTokification of the SAT has resulted in us really just being able to dissect the passage and not really have to read you know, the whole thing very thoroughly, very carefully, like you used to have to on paper. Now it's just kind of like, let me skim through this and look for the the specific data or the specific piece that's being asked here. Um, and then finally, like, sometimes it's actually helpful to learn words now. And I alluded to this at the beginning. There are some great strategies to do this. One is to like learn vocab, um, especially if, you know, English is not your native language. There may be some high lexile words that you have just never encountered. And they're like, what even is this word that's that's being shown here? And so if you have no intuition as like you're, you're taking a practice tests and there's a word that you literally have no intuition towards, regardless of whether, you know, English is your native language or not, right? You should probably maybe look at some of the vocab. Um, and so there, you know, the, I'll, I'll link a link in the description below that has um, some vocab prep. Um, and then when you're actually going through the practice questions uh, using a tool like Aisley or whatever, right, you can really go in and, and try to ask it to dissect the word and, and help you understand that piece. Um, so finally, I'd just like to leave you with this. You guys got this. Really don't stress for this test. Um, you know, this often causes students to like lose sleep the night before and get all stressed for this. You know, if you study smarter, not harder using these techniques, your score will improve, definitely. Um, and so don't stress about the test. You've got this. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments section down below. And be sure to check out Aceley and other links in the description and throughout. Um, so thank you guys so much for watching and um, yeah, stay tuned for more SAT prep videos. Bye.